Well, well thank you. I uh, uh, should say I have spent my career as a business journalist, um, w which means that no one has ever trusted me to solve a business problem, but <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people who are engaged in that. And um, if there's any upside at all, it's perhaps that it allows me to, unencumbered by the complexity of the problems you're facing every day, uh, this allows me to speak freely. Um, so I thought if, if we could, and you know, maybe beginning at the, at the far end of the panel and working our way here, um, I know we're focused here on industry-specific um, needs and industry-specific actions. And, and if we could divide those up a, a bit, if you could just uh, talk to us briefly about the, the handful of things that you're working on uh, in, in your business and your industry that if we were to wave a magic wand and get right would be transformational, um, that, that would be great. And so. Start right with transformational. Okay, that's the easy question. Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ray Dempsey from BP, and I'm delighted to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces, and it's great to, to have an opportunity to talk about something that is clearly uh, near and dear to all of our hearts. We, we really focus a lot on STEM education in the energy industry and certainly at BP because it's the very foundation of the way our industry works. So I'll offer a few thoughts about some of the ways that we are trying to, to really laser focus in on the kind of talent we need. Whether it leads to transformational, uh, we'll, we'll have to see, and I'll, I'll keep this very brief. But we, we start with the realization that we've got to really be focused, and we have to be targeted in who it is that we're going after. And I say that despite also suggesting to you that we are interested in STEM, STEM talent across quite a, a wide spectrum. Uh, from geologists uh, and chemists and engineers of almost every discipline. Um, but, but even more than that, we just had a discussion in the back about how in many of our hourly workforce positions, a STEM foundation is absolutely essential to their ability to compete and, and be successful in the, the work that we do, which is always underpinned by a commitment around safety and reliability. So we, we have to make sure we know where the needs are, both in the short term and the longer term. And we, we then focus in on where is that talent and how can we go and find it. We, we work hard to kind of strengthen and reinforce our employer brand. We like for people to see us as an employer of choice and to think about what it is that might make them want to pursue an, an energy career and, and hopefully, ideally, even at BP. Um, we're delighted that for two years running now, we've topped the uh, approved STEM jobs employer listing, which is a, a list created by a group called Victory Media. And that helps when people get a chance to read and hear about what we do in the space and why they might want to come work um, for our company and in our industry. And then the last thing, and we'll probably say a lot more about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this very short, but we invest in the pipeline. Uh, if we wait to go out and look for talent at the moment that we need it, we're going to lose. And we spent a lot of time, frankly, all the way back into early elementary education, providing support and programs and communities all across the country where, we're, where, we're, where we live and work. Um, we support students as they're getting through high school and going into college. We help them in some early career development programs that we'll say more about. And then ultimately, we really push our own employees to get engaged in the communities where we live and work to be mentors and to be visible and to create um, role models for, for young people to see to help inspire their interests in STEM careers. Okay. Great, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so Gary Eppinger, Carnival Corporation, and you think about you know, talent and what we look for. Carnival's got 120,000 employees. We kind of split them up from shore side to uh, um, seaside, so the folks that's truly on our ships, right, and, and the, the, the different types of jobs that they do from engineering to running the ships, to the cooks, to the entertainment, uh, you know, uh, folks is on the ship, and then the the, the shore side, you know, in, in the in the area of IT which I run, um, we're looking for you know engineers in IT space, uh, IT security, um, data scientists, right? We're moving a lot of our our future uh, relationship to our customers digitized. We talked about that earlier today of how companies are really trying to change the game there. So we, we're absolutely um, you know, engaging in our customers dramatically different. Uh, so that comes all the way down to the systems that we write, so the applications that we, we develop, um, to the folks that are supporting cloud-based environment, uh, which we're driving down uh, you know, dramatically. Um, and then you think about you know, thinking ahead. 
you know, our sourcing team are doing stuff that's dramatically different today, which has a, a huge, uh, you know, math base to it, um, you know, uh, down to the traditional finance uh, teams and how they kind of run our Oracle uh, in, environment. We recently have uh, deployed uh, our first uh, global HR slash um, finance system. So we went, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the guys that go big Oracle, we went big Oracle in an in a interesting way. But it, it, it allowed us to then retool a lot of people that were traditional of how they kind of drove their, their legacy environment. As we talked earlier about there's no legacy um, you know, uh, people, there's only legacy systems. We got rid of our big legacy system, but we took a, a, a workforce that, you know, you know, traditionally we wouldn't have uh, looked at as being the right fit for those types of jobs and retooled them, right, or in the process of retooling them to differently. So, so Carnival, you know, huge install base of positions, but we look at um, individuals of not only what they know, but what they can do and how they can help us uh, delight our customers every day. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, so I'm Allison Knox and um, I work for Microsoft and I do education policy and programs there. And um, I can point to various programs, probably like all of you, um, that we all hope and believe that are transformational. Um, one I would love to actually show so that we could also do some STEM and some coding today. Um, so at some point, if it's OK, I'm going to walk over to that computer. And um, we can all do a quick coding activity. But I'll wait till the next go round to do that. I'm giving everybody a heads up. Mm, all um, right, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> we'll see how we do when all are talking about STEM and computer science. Um, you know, Microsoft's been at this probably, again, like many of the companies here, for a long time and in investing in the pipeline. And um, one of the key areas that we have zeroed in on, on is this issue of how many schools are actually offering computer science across our country. We have 600,000 current openings that require some background in computer science. Um, and last year, approximately, if you took all the PhD students, all the master's degree students, and all the undergraduate degree students, all with some kind of degree in computing, and you added them all up, we came to about 52,000. So there's this gigantic delta. Mm. And so we've zeroed in on where we think in K-12 will make the biggest difference, because we know if a young woman today takes and passes the AP computer science exam, she has 10 times a higher chance in going into computer science in college. Mm. If an African American or Hispanic student takes that same class and does well in that class, similarly, seven times higher chance of going into it. So we're zeroing in right at high school, and then we're saying, of course, we think elementary or middle is really important too. And then you look across the country, and only one out of four high schools in our country offer AP computer science. In some states, like Montana, there are no schools offering it, and no students even getting the option to take it. And I slow down very dramatically, because all I am showing is we all know that we invest in many programs. And we, we just invested $75 million worldwide in computer science education programs. I mean, we have a wonderful program where we take a software engineer and we have them co-teach with an existing teacher in high schools in a program called TEALS. And they teach AP computer science. But the big question to all of us, I think, is we can continue as a private sector trying really hard to kind of band-aid what is happening in our country while we're looking at these figures and this big delta. We can also rally around and unify together as one voice and say, you know, we think that every student in this country should get at least the chance to learn about data science skills, computational thinking skills, how lettuce bot programs for Monsanto, 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 <laughs> Monsanto sorry, is uh, you know increasing the quality and the efficiency and the sustainability of agriculture. It just seems like a foundational skill for all students, and we'd love to join with you to to find a way to make that happen. I can before we. Oh, gee, go ahead, Edie. That's that's great, clap. Uh, I mean, but that, those figures are striking. You know, one in four um, high schools offer this that AP class that 
you know, talk about transformational, clearly that is, that, that is one. Um, and you've just issued a call to arms. I mean, uh, in a way, what, 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 how do you, how do you view the, how do you view that effort, and where, where are we in it? I mean, where's the whole industry in that effort? Sure. Um, so there is a brand new coalition called the um, Computer Science Education Coalition. It's just been launched six weeks ago. Uh, we are over ninety companies and organizations who joined. I don't know if anybody got the Washington Post two days ago and the whole back page of the front section was an open letter to Congress with 27 governors signing on, 14 Republicans, 13 Democrats, an article feature in the inside. Everyone saying in K-12, there it is, Edie has it. Oh, Everyone saying in a unified voice in this coalition along with code.org, which we help found and support, saying again, every student in this nation should at least have that chance to take computer science before they graduate from high school. So uh, the first thing everybody can do is help join the coalition and every industry we need in there. We need security, because obviously cybersecurity impacts all of us. We need agriculture, we need fashion and design, we need oil and gas, we need every industry to say, now is the time. Okay. Well, thank you. And we're on the verge of making news uh, here, actually. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. And Great. Thank you, Melissa Harper. And I lead global talent acquisition and inclusion and diversity for Monsanto. And if I just lead with transformational, it will be that everyone in this room and everywhere that we touch really understands the importance of STEM and STEM roles in agriculture, um, really for our society, the benefit of our society. We are a 20,000 plus person organization in almost 70 countries around the globe. And yes, while we are working with farmers, we're working with NGOs, academia, um, all types of organizations to, to feed a growing population. And we all hear the statistics. Um, I kind of think about that is, as by 2050, the world will add an equivalent of an additional China and India. And in shrinking natural resources, that's a call to action. And so for us, when we think about opportunities in agriculture, it's how do we get the word out? Um, ag research um, in education is one huge opportunity, particularly in the US, where we have countries such as China and Brazil outspending what we are doing in the US for ag uh, education. And so we're really trying to uh, play a, a forefront role in that. Um, when we think about agriculture in the U.S., it's a major employer, and not everyone will get the Silicon Valley jobs for software engineers, but we too are looking for software engineers. In fact, even in Brazil, if anyone knows some. Um, <laughs> But in the US for agriculture, there are about 60,000 jobs every year. And remarkably, that number, about half go unfilled because we don't have the either technical skills to fill them or more importantly, the awareness of the opportunities that exist in agriculture from geospatial engineers, software engineers, data scientists, um, to we recently, too, like the prior CEO talked about, we recently hired a, a head of the Internet of Things. And who would have thought? And yet we're competing um, for the same data scientists that everyone um, in the world really is. Um, I think I read a recent statistic that talked about in a few short years, a job that did not even exist five years ago called data scientist, in a few short years will have a gap a need of about a million um, data scientists across the world. So that call to action is huge, and I know shortly we'll talk about some examples. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm uh, Jean Healy from FedEx Freight. I'm the uh, responsible for strategic planning engineering uh, at the, one of the FedEx operating companies. And at FedEx, uh, we have a mission. We believe in a mission, and that mission is really clearly stated. We connect people and possibilities around the world. And when that happens, Businesses flourish, communities thrive, and people grow, and the world becomes a better place. And the key word in that mission statement, if we will, is the second word, is connect. 
Because if you think about what FedEx does, we have an enormous amount of physical assets, right? So 340,000 team members around the globe, 221 countries and territories, 673 aircraft, 100,000 plus vehicles, and we connect those to 11 million shipments a day from a physical perspective, and then from a digital perspective, every day our website has 13 and a half million interactions with 6.5 million transactions of people just tracking their packages. And what we've been able to do in the 43 years of our history, and we believe that we're connect, of connecting those physical and digital assets, is through innovation. And you've heard a lot of people talk today about innovation and how inc incredible it is, how important it is. For FedEx, innovation is really part of our DNA. It's part of our culture. And the only way to truly get innovation is through the people and your team members that are there. And so the number one job of our leadership team, whether you're a frontline manager or you're the CEO, is to attract, develop, and retain the top talent. And so if I could wave a magic wand, and you ask the magic wand, we have to fill those you know, STEM and the partnerships that we have here today that we're talking about and that the partnerships and the things that we do at FedEx at all of our locations are really about trying to grow that capability. So if I could wa wave a magic wand, it would be how do I get the talent that I need in the places that I need it at? And some of those are less traditional places. So you've heard a lot of the traditional kind of STEM jobs. So there's engineers and data scientists. There's a, in our, I looked on our careers website today. FedEx has a great careers website, fedex.com, go to the bottom. The number one job where we have five pages of openings right now is in maintenance technicians. If you've ever been to one of our shops, and probably most of you haven't, uh, you think about a maintenance technician, about somebody turning a wrench, mm -hmm. not anymore. They're plugging their tough book into the J bus of the computer that is on the tractor, or they're using an iPad to take a video of a, an engine, an aircraft engine, to send that video back to the, the engineer to help them repair something. And so that capability of needing to have that connectedness is in those non-traditional places is where we really need some help. And so that would be, if, that would be my, way, my magic wand is get the talent, help us develop the talent, let us make sure that we share you, with you and everybody here where those opportunities are, because I think that's one of the challenges, that transparency and visibility to the, where the, the jobs are, people just don't even know. Well, and it's interesting, I mean, to kind of put all this together, um, there's clearly a, a, a huge shortfall uh, that, that the, the industry faces, but you know, even within that, who would have thought that you're looking for an Internet of Things um, skill set, or who would have thought cybersecurity cruise line. So I just wonder if I could, and we'll come back to, come back to Microsoft and all this, but for, for, the, for the others here, I wonder if you could talk a bit about you know, your, your challenge in, in that regard um, as a destination that maybe wouldn't be immediately on the radar for someone who's, who's graduating next week with those skills. So cybersecurity in particular. Well, well yes, uh, talk uh, about cybersecurity. Uh, <laughs> STEM, I suppose, you know, broadly. And people would think, you know, a, geology, geosciences, right. they may not be thinking Internet of, of Things, or, or they may not be thinking against sort of the over-the-horizon needs that you're trying to develop. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I will not try to talk about cybersecurity sitting next to a cybersecurity expert. I, <laughs> I, I, I know better than to, to step into that. We, we have to really help to open eyes as to what the STEM discipline connection is in the world of energy. I think I heard Melissa say a little while ago that there will be a new China and India over the next few decades. And one of the things that matters to us is we, we look out into the next two decades in the world of energy and we project that there's going to be some 35% greater demand around the world for energy. And I'm, like Melissa did, I put that into the context of saying take all the energy consumed today in the world's number one energy consuming nation, which is China and then take all the energy consumed today in the world's number two energy consuming nation, which is not India, it's the United States. We need that much more, all of China and the US daily consumption, we need that much more in just two decades. So for us, what it means is that the challenge isn't just about the investment in the pipeline to help grow interest in STEM education, it's also even more focused on helping people to think about the energy world in and of itself. 
We all love to flip the light switch and appreciate the luxury of the lights coming on. Uh, we like that our cars go. We like that our houses are, are heated. So that heat, light, and mobility really are the, the daily sort of almost invisible um, outcomes of, of the work we do in the energy industry. And so we're investing in, in, a, in several ways to try to create an awareness. We've got an alliance with AS Aztec, the Association of Science Technology Centers, where they're going to have an energy education initiative, and that'll help um, teachers go to science centers and museums around the country, be exposed to a, a curricula that they can then take back and, and use in their, in their schools, in their classrooms, to share just a greater understanding, not about BP, not about oil and gas necessarily, but about how energy works, how the value chain works to create the experiences that, that we all enjoy. So for us, it, it, it ultimately does link to STEM and STEM education and STEM careers, but we're appreciating that unique to our challenge is helping to create an, an interest and an excitement about the way you can participate in providing energy for a growing global demand. Yes, so when I, when I think about you know, the challenge from a cybersecurity perspective, is, it's not about the security, right? You know, we've had cybersecurity you know, incidents, issues for the last 100 plus years, right? But if you think about what businesses are doing now, they're dramatically leveraging data more right, information more to, to drive a different relationship, conversation with their customer, drive their products differently, and what they design, how they design it. It's a, a lot more IP out there they want to protect, right? So it, it, as we think about cybersecurity, it's, it's how do we embed security in all of our processes, right, so we can be more efficient in how we control it. And, and it's not the, the, the guy that's sitting around, you know, that's, that's in, the, in the corner that's, that's, that's coding all the time, right? Um, and I used to be that guy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the person that truly understands the business. So you think about who can translate business needs into a, into a process that's controllable in an uncontrolled manner, right? We're, we're, we're truly, you know, destroying and changing our businesses every day, right? And that's exciting stuff but it puts opportunities for us to do things the wrong way, which makes companies you know, vulnerable for things to happen. So we're looking for you know, cyber guys that, that don't come through the traditional path a lot of time. They come from non-traditional, but they understand the business, they understand the customer, they understand what, um, what's needed to be um, successful and what's going to relate the, the best and then you can put the, the security component around it. Great. And, and Allison, I think we'll come back. And I get, you have a demonstration you want to uh, experiment we're going to do. But if uh, we can... I, I'll, I'll jump down while you're talking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. For, uh, for, for us, and I think we've all talked about it, every decision um, is being driven by data and information. And so that's no different for agriculture. You know, farmers every crop season everywhere around the world make upwards of 40 plus decision, decisions in that year. They don't think about it in terms of each one. It's, that's, that would be too overwhelming. But it's the data and information when we think about the future of the role that digital will play in agriculture or ag technology that will help simplify that, uh, make it more uh, e efficient. And, and sustainable. And so we think about that in terms of those are the skills that we'll need uh, to help farmers kind of boil down those 40 plus over, overwhelming decisions, each one filled, fueled by data and information. And then I think for us too, it's um, we, we've talked a little bit about that partnering younger. You know, we've really um, done some things to say, let's turn the, the role of internship around and why can't you be in high school and have an internship? And so we've started within our own community where we're headquartered in, in looking at underrepresented um, students at finishing their sophomore year in high school, bringing them in in the summer for an um, intern-like experience um, to increase their awareness in agribusiness. And they'll stay with us until they graduate high school. They may be feeders to, to us or to any companies here, but it's how do you start younger and really put some intention behind that's, it. That's really interesting, and that's in St. Louis? Yes. Uh, how, how, how many students have you had go through that, and is it early enough to, to, for you to have some data on how mm -hmm. yeah. successful it has been and encouraging them into STEM 
uh, majors in college and coming yeah. into the industry. Yeah, our, um, our first year was last summer and we thought about this idea in, um, it was about February, March, and it was let's make it happen by May or June. So, um, so that first class is a small class of about 12 students, but really impactful because we did a day in the life, um, a hiring blitz, much like we would for any other big IT type of hiring opportunity. Um, and that brought out hundreds of students. And it was really interesting to see that in many cases, um, first time interviewing, or you'll see teachers who bought a suit or something to interview for, for the students. So um, it was the power of how it will be magnified based, on, you know, not just the, the 12, but and that will continue to grow. Yeah. So I think the, the question, I think, is what are some of the things that are, we're looking at into the future where jobs that people aren't thinking about today? Is that? And also, if people think maybe FedEx, they think logistics and trucks, but they may not think connected city. They may not think data science. There are a whole range of things, perhaps. Yeah, so, so if you, you look at what we do today, so we do 11 million shipments a day. Each of those gets 25 scans today. That's 275 million. Sounds like a big number. We are looking at Internet of Things like sensors today that throw off 3.7 million records an hour. And so when you take something for another just stat for the, for the stat folks in the room, useless facts, if you will, the <laughs> FedEx Express operating company in the United States drives 2.8 million miles a day. So if you can take the connected sensors and a smart city and allow us to reduce the number of miles that we drive, that has huge impacts for us. You know, as far as from the sustainability of the planet that we're living on, it's less gas burned and less tires used. And obviously for us, we can get better service if we can drive fewer miles. So that interconnectedness of sensors and the um, enormous amounts of data that are going to get churned out of that and be able to have people that understand how to plow through it, because right now that is a skill that's in relatively short supply. The other skill that we are really trying to source that people just don't think about from a transportation company is uh, user experience designers. So you look at our website and it looks really, really good. And then you look at our internal systems and they look like they were built with MS-DOS, you know. <laughs> Nothing against DOS, by the way. That's okay. And, it's, and so trying to find the talent to go and help our operations folks design our systems in a way that our team members are used to seeing because they're carrying around their smartphones and they know what an app's supposed to look like. And then they look at their FedEx handheld and go, where have you guys been living, you know, under a rock? So that, that's, a, that's a thing you, you maybe you don't always think about from a STEM perspective, but that user experience design, it requires this really interesting blend of psychology and science from an interactions perspective. It's, it's, a, it's a really important force. Okay. Well, and, and okay, speaking of MS-DOS, um, did, uh -huh. did, did you want to... Uh, <laughs> sure. You had a, sure. an experiment you wanted to, I guess... Yeah, we'll, we'll wait on this experiment just because we're trying to get the screen. I don't want to do double mic, but I... I just, Been undone by technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, the two... I just wanted to mention some interesting jobs. Whenever I get a chance to go to Redmond and talk with folks in Microsoft Research, I love hearing about what the new jobs are coming. So I just want to tell a couple. One is whenever I get to work with this one particular woman, her name is Astra, She's a designer and she's created a new shawl and the shawl is filled with LED lights that help a person with SAD um, feel better during the winter months. Of course, we probably all could just use this, right? But now it's a shawl that you can wear and she's done all the design so that you don't see the lights so that you can take the light wherever you go. Hmm. And it senses when you're feeling sad. So it's just an. So I talk with someone like that, and I think, oh, I got to tell this to a teacher. I got to tell this to a student. Um, another one is detecting emotions with kids, and so their teachers know if they're feeling extra stressed in the morning or any time, and it, it's like a kind of a porcupine design, so things pop up a little bit, so that people understand that maybe they're not starting this lesson on the best foot. But all that sensory detection and then all that data that flows from it, those are all new and upcoming jobs. And just one, one more, which is real-time translation. 
Skype translator. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But you need a computational linguist on the back end, someone who understands the hardware, and then someone who can actually program it so that people on both sides are speaking two different languages, but the language that they both see is the one that they identify with. And if you think of a person who actually can't hear, that can also be extremely powerful. So those are just three really cool jobs. And I saw something come up, but it's gone. That's OK. Go <laughs> ahead. Should we, should we spin ahead and then? I mean, I wanted to, and, and we've touched on this, um, and it's come up before, but I wanted to return to the question of diversity. And, um, and it relates to the pipeline. I mean, and there's, there's a, a moral and social justice argument for this, and we could stop there. But there's also a business imperative, uh, too. And I, you know, you, you've, you've all kind of individually talked on what you're doing, but I wonder if I could return to that and how you're approaching it in a way that's unique to your business and, and your industry. Kevin, I'll start. I, I have to admit, I, I spend a lot of time now trying to move away from the moral and social arguments, not because I don't believe very deeply in them, but there's a real business imperative, there's a real business value proposition. There's a lot of data to support it. We've experienced it and observed it in our, in our own company, in our own activities. So we, we have a deep commitment, but I have to admit, it's, it's hard work. And uh, the energy industry, oil and gas especially, has been a white male dominated industry for, well, since the beginning. Um, I, in my 26 years in, in this company, I've seen us do an awful lot, and there's been some terrific uh, initiatives, efforts, priorities, commitments, and, and frankly, we've made some really real progress, um, but there's still a long way to go. We, we try to drive our diversity and inclusion agenda through a couple of constructs. We, we have a, a diversity and inclusion advisory council that is chaired by our, our BP America chairman and president. Um, I sit on that. It's made up of the, the most senior business leaders of, of our business presence in the United States and uh, a few very senior functional leaders. Uh, I, I get the privilege of being one of those. John Minje was in the book that you all have on your table as one of the top 100 CEOs um, in, in STEM. We're, we're, we're really proud of that. We, we try to do three things because I know I'm going to go way too long if I get too excited about this topic. Um, so I'll, I'll say this fast. We try to ensure there's broad awareness about what our commitments are and, and how it is we're trying to drive the agenda. Almost all of our senior and middle level managers have been through a diversity and inclusion um, program. And everybody who's promoted into one of those levels is, is going to take that within their first year in their new job. So the awareness we think is really important. We, we provide a lot of support. We've got, like I know many other companies do, a, a, a network of business resource groups. Um, we cover the entire spectrum from gender and ethnicity. Um, we have a gray matters business resource group for the, the more mature of our employees. And I, I find myself now fitting in that category, surprisingly. But it's, it's, it's actually been a powerful way for us to help our employees understand our commitment to, to their efforts to help drive not just their mutual support, but really helping to drive the business agenda. And then we got expectations. We don't just talk about our good intentions. We've, we set some very clear expectations, and they become part of our performance management processes. In particular, we have a focus now on gender. And for our most senior women in the company, we, we sit today at about 20%, and we've set an, a target of trying to get to 25% by 2020, and that's made a real difference in the way that we have thought about the choices we make, the way that we identify and then help to develop talent. We, we clearly then, in addition to those internal things, we'll partner with people who really know about this. Um, we're delighted to be part of VD's um, efforts around the Maine Women Mentors, and that's been a, a great development, uh, led by Kathleen Martinez, my colleague sitting here at the front. Um, I, I sit on the board of a group called NACME, the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering. And we've been a, we were a founding board company, so more than 40 years with NACME. And we work closely with the big student organizations in the diversity space, um, notably SWE, Society of Women Engineers, and SHIP, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers. All those things together help us to move the needle, even if it's for us slower than we'd like. But it's a, it's a real commitment. Again, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, well, you leave much time there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just to um, try to talk a little bit about from a Carnival perspective, you know, if you go back, you know, uh, not too long ago, you know, Carnival didn't look, you know, diverse at all. 
you know, it was a traditional company, uh, European uh, white males, they kind of ran it, right? If you look at Carnival today, and it's absolutely a focus for us uh, of kind of to drive the, to make a difference. Uh, you know, 10 different brands, three of our brand presidents are females, right, today. In the last three years, we've made that change. Today, the, the, the CEO of the company is an African American, today. The chief security guy is an African American, today. <laughs> you know him. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so a very, uh, diverse senior leadership. All of their team um, is driven in a very diverse manner. And, and we do that for one reason, because it makes sense from a business perspective. It's all about diversity of thought for us. We're bringing in great ideas from a very diverse global organization, um, and it's making us different, right? So where the products that we put out are different, the, how we relate to our customers. You know, you, know, you look at the, the 20 million customers that, that sail on one of our ships. One out of every two people that sail on the ship today is on one of our brands, right? So therefore we have to be and look like and talk like and act like and understand our customers in many different ways. So that's why we do it and it's from the top all the way down. Okay. Thank you, yeah. I'm sorry, I, th I think Allison, we may have short-circuited your- <laughs> No, 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 it's fine. Um, I, I don't wanna repeat many of the comments that were made when you're designing products you want as many people and as many perspectives coming to the products to make them the most innovative and effective possible. Um, it's, I, I guess what I would just want to add that it's really interesting as a female in the tech industry, <laughs> so there aren't as many of us. Um, I think diversity is a challenge for just the tech industry in general. Um, to consider when people feel invited to an industry and when they just it, I don't, I think it's a dance. I think it's both ways. I think sometimes people immediately count themselves out because they don't know what Python is or they don't know what the latest Windows 10 would be. So I would never apply for this job. And, and from what I understand, females do this quite often where they just literally count themselves out. And so that just, I, and I know for me, had I not taken some basic computer science, I mean, I was a literature major undergrad, right? But if I hadn't taken some basic computer science, would I have had sort of this interest and in belief in myself that I could compete for a job at a company like Microsoft? So it's, so it's building that self-efficacy. And one way you can do that is to do what I was trying to do, which was go to a website called code.org. <laughs> Yay. Right. So let's do it really fast. Go real, real fast. quick. Really fast. Ready? We're gonna oh. <laughs> we're gonna do STEM. This is my big commitment at conferences. Let's do it. So you just go to code.org, go to Hour of Code, pick a tutorial. How many of you have done this? Oh my goodness. Okay, next year, Edie, all the hands have to go up. This is a great way to expose kids to the basics of coding and adults. Pick one of them. Look at Star Wars, Minecraft. That's fun. How about Elsa and Anna? Oops. Here's Elsa and Anna, and what it does is it gives you 20 levels, progressively getting harder, of coding. And really the best is HTML. So that is Second basic language for all websites. Grade. I was in eighth grade when I learned to program. I got my first computer when I was oh, in sixth grade. Oh, sorry. So uh, that's Mark Zuckerberg what talking. What gets me excited is being able to fix people's I will stop computer. him. You can express yourself. There's little videos. See, there's Carly Kloss, there's Bill Gates. Everybody talks. It's really fun. And so we're going to do this together, really quickly. Elsa would like to help get some help creating a single line. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, we take the challenge. You see up here, these are the 20 challenges. Over on the left, this is where you get to try out your work. Here, the blocks are um, your, the, that, it's called Blockly. It's a graphical interface that makes it simpler to program. And on the right is your workspace. So let's take one of these, and all you do is drag it over and you let it click. <laughs> this is not my laptop, there we go. So when run, move forward by 100 pixels. Everybody know what a pixel is? Okay, let's see if we did it right. Ready? We're gonna hit run. We're on puzzle two. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you did STEM today, yay! And I'm telling you, it gets really, really it's hard. <laughs> I've had adults work on this for 20 hours. 
I mean, sorry, two hours, and I've had some students finish this in nine minutes. It's great to get kids helping adults in a program to do this. And then there's all kinds of videos, how coding is embedded in all these industries. And they're colorful and fun and musical. And I just invite you to try it so we can get everybody getting excited about coding. Thanks. Okay. All right. Unplanned and unsolicited endorsement, but I have a seven-year-old who dragged me through this. And yeah! at the at the end, you get a certificate to show, and that's uh, was it. Twenty hours for you, or seven? <laughs> I was at the slow end of the curve, no question. And I'm I'm an English major. But it is interesting how many adults count themselves out. Oh, I don't do that. Right. And then you get them to do it, and they get excited, and they're doing it with their children, and then they start asking questions about, oh my gosh, this is the future. Why isn't it in my school? Uh, th thank you. And, and um, I'm conscious of time. I want to save some time for questions. But Melissa, if I could go back to the question of Diverse. diversity. And I know in Monsanto in particular, uh, among other things, you've made a, a push on uh, the promotion of women managers. And mm -hmm. wondered if I could talk to you about it. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Very exciting. Very <laughs> exciting. Um, as we speak, um, St. Louis and Monsanto happens to be uh, hosting again FIRST Robotics. And my 10-year-old son will be there, the world one, and, and really exciting. Um, in the space of inclusion and diversity, and, and I'll come back to, we've been really intentional to call out inclusion first. They really are two different things, and we've made a decision to say, we've got to focus on both and. When you think about companies that have been in the journey of pushing diversity, and you don't see change, you know, years go by, decades, and culture matters, and that's the inclusion part. And so we've been intentional around both. And, and we have a similar, um, you know, where we have senior leaders, uh, Hugh Grant, our CEO, president, and others that um, hold accountable, and, and we have um, inclusion councils, and our board holds us accountable. We report to our board with great transparency on how are we showing up from an inclusive and diverse perspective. We're on a path towards um, taking all of our global leaders through unconscious bias awareness uh, as well, understanding what are everyday acts of inclusion. Um, we have transparency through metrics, through what we call a pure diversity dashboard that um, looks at how are we performing from a human capital metrics, promotions, movement into management. What have you done from a retro perspective with the opportunities you've had to influence? And then from a proactive, we are starting now an inclusion index that measures leaders on, again, that, that culture that they create. Um, so those are a number of things that um, I, I kind of boil it down to think about it simply because it can be really so many things and so big. Um, three simple things, and it's culture, mindset, and systems. And so, of course, we've talked a little bit about culture and, and mindset. Mindset is interesting because typically when you talk to an audience anywhere around the world and you ask by show of hands, I, I won't do that for this group, but how many people see themselves as diverse, typically not every hand goes up. And we really won't ever win when you think about the, the business case for inclusion uh, until every individual sees themselves as diverse because it's humanity. There, you can't differentiate between the two. Um, so that becomes really critical in our journey. That's the mindset. And again, systems, it's all the operational, the process, the holding leaders accountable. Every, um, every pipeline um, has to have a certain you know, percentage of whether it's women or other ethnic groups represented. Um, understanding from a global scale, what does diversity from a, a segmentation look like uh, in Brazil versus China, for example. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Sean. So I would, I would repeat a lot of the same things you all said. So I'm going to go back to something Ray said uh, at the outset, which is this is a business imperative. And so if you put it into context for FedEx, so our headquarters is in Memphis, Tennessee. We have about 35,000 team members in the city. Um, when we're competing for STEM talent, number one, we're competing against cities like San Francisco and Washington DC and Seattle. And I, I consider Memphis my home, but uh, other people don't consider Memphis as sexy as some of those other cities, right? <laughs> and so part of our business imperative for number one, spending a lot of time focusing on STEM in Memphis is because we need to fill that pipeline with the people who are the K through 12 students today. So one of the things that we've done is partner with uh, the West Tennessee STEM Hub. 
and created a partnership of public and private uh, from a pu public perspective, all the universities in the area, it connects to 17,000 teachers and 240,000 K through 12 students to create awareness and transparency about what is available in the STEM areas from our perspective and then what kind of skills they need to get there. So that allows us to really reach the, a population that's a very diverse population so that our workforce ultimately in Memphis reflects what the community looks like. I want to get to questions, but I just want to ask one um, hard question um, that I would feel, I guess, remiss if I didn't ask. And we're, we're at Gallup, which of course is you know, de devoted to understanding in real time what Americans uh, think, and including what they think about the world. And we're in a, an election cycle in which at both ends of uh, the ideological spectrum, um, sort of the free movement of capital uh, goods and labor uh, are very much up for debate. And I just, we, we've talked about the big delta, you know, the, what was the number, 50,000 versus 650,000. And we've talked about uh, education within the United States, but how does that, how does this, this dynamic, how does it change the way you're thinking about your global workforce, or, or does it, or does it present a, uh, a particular challenge? And it's a hard question, and I mentioned politics, so if you want to opt out, that's fine, but if you want to raise your hand, I'll, I'll throw it open for you. Yeah, so, you know, you know, personally, I don't think of it from a politic um, perspective, but it is truly, you know, being a global company, we got to think about how we find, retain, promote, um, you know, our workforce around the world. It's not just, you know, the ones here in Miami, you know, where our corporate headquarters is, but it's around the world. And, and we, we, we try to look at it differently because there's different issues in different parts of the world of, of how you attack that particular problem. Anyone else want to? Yep. I, I think quickly, obviously the, the politics and changing administrations in every country has an impact on labor, ability to compete, access to labor. So I think that's true for all of us that look for talent globally. Um, really quickly, I would just add, for me, I think this, we're looking, we're at the forefront of thinking about the workforce of the future, and we won't have enough time to, to delve into that, but I think for all of us, that's really huge. And it's not just about the growing millennial population, but it's crowdsourcing. You know, what, what about when the definition of what we call an employee today changes because how people can get paid differs. Okay. So I just wanted to mention one thing, which is I think we're all really proactive people up here as well as out there. And we all want to get ahead of some of the forecasts about us as a country falling behind. And I know I sound like a broken record, but in Great Britain, just in terms of that mindset of we don't want our country to fall behind, in Great Britain right now, at every grade level, every student is required to do some sort of computer science. In China, you don't graduate, graduate from high school without it. Japan is starting to look at and wanting to mimic within three years what's going on in Great Britain. Estonia is coming on board and Australia. And in this country, one out of four schools in the United States even offer computer science. Okay. So let's get proactive about this okay. situation. Let's, can we take a, a question from a proactive member of the audience? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, ma please. Um, do you have a... Sabina O'Hara, I'm the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Sciences here at the University of the District of Columbia. Um, huge talent gap that you describe, um, and yet I haven't really heard how we are rethinking the gateway through which that talent pool enters the STEM field. And so I really want to make a big pitch here. You mentioned um, you know, the growth in population. Well, here in the United States, already 80% of us live in urban metropolitan areas. Globally, it's 60%. So those two billion that you described are going to be in urban mm -hmm. environments. And yet, we continue to think of agriculture as farming out there with big combines instead of tomato robots on green roofs mm -hmm. and aquaponic systems and vertical growing, right? So sometimes it's really rethinking how the talent 
enters mm -hmm. and what that gateway is that piques people's interest yep. in STEM fields. Um, and, and that kind of much more interdisciplinary, connecting the dots kind of thing, because you know the young people are leading the way in that. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And we, we certainly um, don't think about jobs farming on a tractor, but let's also not forget how technically savvy tractors are um, today. But when we think about that entree point, it's bringing it to students and people younger, taking scientists to the classrooms at that K through 12, um, as well as bringing them to our campus and our campuses that exist around the world so they can see and get excited and um, again creating that awareness to food and agriculture and natural resources broadly and the potential that exists there so i, I mean there, there's probably a lot there that we would have time to address but i absolutely agree and, and we we certainly don't believe and we can't afford to wait um, to bring that awareness okay we're at the two minute warning uh, maybe, maybe one more uh, sir in the back um, Right here. There's, she's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Allison. Um, I've recently moved into the uh, need or the promotion of computer science and education, and your coalition is attractive to me in that way. But my question is to you: with all of the cities that are mandating, city governments that are mandating computer science in their school districts, like New York, Chicago, and others, will your coalition, your education coalition, begin to provide a collective impact across the US that will really make a difference in this whole education space? Right, so those two cities are great. Um, Arkansas as a state is now asking every high school to require offering a course, and it's, Oh, congrats, Asa Hutchinson, and <laughs> props there, right? It's a Walmart. A Walmart, yay. I hope you can join the coalition. Uh, it's just really interesting because what you're asking is if states and communities do stand up and say, we want this, how are we going to support them? And I think every company in this room and up here would say, I've got a program, I've got a program, let's, and they're all really good programs. Right? They really, I mean, we really try, I think, really hard on fidelity and impact and how many reports have we written, right? And the question is this whole idea of accessibility and funding. And funding gets political. Right. <laughs> so if someone were really tough, they'd say, it's great you have a new coalition. What's it asking to do? What's it, ask, what's it there for? And I could position it to appeal to R's or D's right now. Right? Bottom line is, we feel as a coalition, it's time to ask appropriators at the federal level to provide some funding, some funding, so that local communities and states that are engaged can apply for some funding to build the kinds of programs, engagement programs, curriculum programs, teacher training programs, whatever they think is best, they can apply for those dollars so that they can support and achieve what it is for those two cities who've already said, let's make a requirement, right? The moment, though, I start to say federal money in public education, all kinds of perceptions happen right there, right? And, and so I'm, I just appeal to all of us in our best sense that I truly believe when there's 14 Republican governors and 13 Democratic governors all signing a letter saying this is the way forward, we have to believe some issues are just bipartisan. Mm. And we just sign on. Okay. Well, I've, I've just been asked for a 30-second uh, summary of what we've just discussed, and I feel uh, incapable of doing that. I mean, <laughs> Ray, 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 could I put you on the spot just for the remaining 26 seconds? To... <laughs> you know, I, I think it really builds on where Allison ended there. We, we need to certainly continue to build the collaboration, the efforts between the corporations, the, the nonprofits, academia. None of us have the capacity to, to solve this problem independently. We, we have to work together. Uh, but I think we also have to really push on our governments at, at every level, local, state, and federal. We have to treat this challenge as, as an urgent national crisis. It's not just a problem that 
a few years from now will really be a, be a nuisance. This is a, 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 a fundamental challenge to our ability to continue to compete. And you, you heard some of the examples of, of progress being made in places all around the world. And our ability to innovate, to provide jobs, and actually to continue to be one of the leading economies in the world is absolutely hinged upon our ability to, to significantly change the trajectory of where we're headed around STEM education. So somehow, that combination of two things, for me, is the essence of, of the conversation. We need to continue to work in the collaborative way that STEM Connector helps us to do in a forum like this, and we've got to find a way to continue to impress upon our elected officials to treat this not just as a nuisance, but a critical, urgent crisis. I'd like to thank our, our, our panel and thank all of you for your attention. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much.